We've got some exciting projects coming up that help us bring the beauty of the garden indoors. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and creative ways to push the boundaries of your home out into the garden to expand your living space. In today's show, we're going to take a look at the principal shape and form. We're going to look at plants in an abstract way, boil them down to their basic shapes. For instance, a tree, like this crab apple, follows the traditional tree shape that resembles a lollipop, a circle on a stick. This holly is a cone-shaped plant, and these boxwoods, well, they're round. The shape and form of plants can inspire our garden designs. I can recall using the columnar-shaped Italian cypress in several designs as a way to introduce a sense of rhythm and establish a strong architectural presence, much the same way an architect might design a home with columns. Shape and form can also affect the way we bring the garden home indoors. We may grow flowers in our gardens that are tall and spiky to use in flower arrangements. We may choose to plant shrubs that produce round, plump berries, ideal for winter decorating, or even tall trees that give us long limbs full of colorful autumn leaves. In this show, we'll take a look at some ideas on how to bring the garden indoors, including these beautiful calla lilies with their sleek, sensual shape. I'll take you to a farm in Holland where they're producing these lovely blooms, and we'll learn a little bit about how to grow them in our own gardens. Plus, I'll put together two beautiful winter wreaths that embody the idea of today's show on shape and form. Plus, we'll meet an internationally recognized garden designer whose ideas on shape and form are influencing current and future garden designers. There's a lot coming up in this half hour, so let's get started. A stunning flower. I think one of the reasons calla lilies are so attractive to us is because they're so simple. I just love the way the stem merges beautifully with the bloom as you can see here. It shouldn't be any surprise that this plant would inspire artists. You see it as a popular motif during the Art Deco period which started about 1900 and ended about 1930. The calla lily bloom was the favored form for many objects of art. Its long slender stem was like those of the long lines of a woman's dress. In fact, if you flip the flower over, it looks like a 1920s dress. If you're a fan of old movies, you probably know just the sort of dress I'm talking about. It's long, slender, and sleek, just like the high fashion of the day. Who can resist these blooms as cut flowers? They are the simplest flower to arrange. All you need is a big tall vase like this and a big bouquet of calla lilies. I'm using about 30 blooms in this one container and it'll be a real knockout. You know, one of the great things about this plant as a cut flower is that they'll last so long in the vase. Now in the garden, over the years, I discovered that my calla lilies didn't really come back and bloom consistently year after year. And I finally learned the reason why after a visit to Holland. Ryan, the calla lily has always been popular in the United States, but do you see its popularity growing in other parts of the world? Yes, it's and, and it's because of the of the of the new colors we have. We have them from from white till to black, and every color between it. Now, this particular variety we're seeing um, in this plastic house is a variety called um, Captain Rodin. Yes, Captain Rodin. That's that's from a breeding house in the Netherlands. Well, it's a beautiful flower. It's, it's a, it's a cream-colored flower, largely, and then it has this kind of purple blush to it. Yes, yes, yes. Now, yes. how are they harvested? Do you cut them, or are they, they pulled from the plant? Yes, that's very easy to do. When you go with your hand a little bit down. So you reach down in like this and just give it a little tug. Yes, yes, it's I very see. easy, easy to, to pick them out, very easy right. to harvest. I, I see how you get such a long stem now. Yes, yes. <laughs> now you can grow this variety in your garden if you'd like. Yes, 
is also uh, possible. When you, when you get the bulb home and you get ready to plant it, about how, how much soil should you put on top of the bulb? Well, about uh, this, this uh, soil on the top of the yeah. tuber, that, that's enough. About four inches of soil, yeah, yes, very yes. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I've grown calla lilies uh, in partial uh, shade. Mm -hmm. uh, where they get half day sun and they've done very well. Yeah, that's, that's also good. They like the light, but also in half shade, is, uh, they're growing well also. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can't expect calla lilies to bloom heavily the second year. Let's say you live in a part of the country where the tubers will not freeze out and they'll come back. They're probably not going to bloom the second year, are they? No, uh, lesser than the year before. Then you, when you buy them for f fresh tubers, uh, yes. the first time of the, the garden center, but but you have the, well this this variety has has an also nice foliage, but you have also varieties who have very uh, foliage like like a uh, Die van Bachia or something. Yes, but, but spotted, yes. Uh, variegated in yeah, lots of yeah, ways, yeah, yeah. even some dark foliage, calla lilies. And then maybe with one or two blooms. Uh, but not more. No, no. When you buy them, when you want to have blooms in your garden, you have to buy them every year. Yeah. Plant them every year. Yeah. Very good. Because we, we give them a special uh, a temperature treatment so they uh, give as many flowers as they can. Over the years, I've learned if you want really happy plants, you've got to start with good soil. Whether you're planting trees, shrubs, flowers in your flower beds, or bulbs like I'm doing today, the soil is so important. My homemade compost is a key element. Each year, fall leaves turn into garden gold in this compost corral. When I start to plant a bed, I like to work in some of this magic because it helps to aerate the soil and infuses it with new nutrients, which young plants will eat up. You know, bulbs are some of the easiest flowers to grow because the bloom is actually packaged within this little brown wrapper. They're virtually foolproof. But you know, one of the common questions I get asked is, should I pre-chill my spring flowering bulbs? Well, that depends on the type of bulb you're planting and where you live. If you're planting daffodils, they don't have to be pre-chilled. They can be planted almost anywhere in the country. In fact, I've planted daffodils as early as the 1st of September and as late as January, and they've always performed beautifully. On the other hand, tulips, hyacinths, and crocus need a period of dormancy where they stay really cool from 40 to 45 degrees for at least six to eight weeks. Now, if you live in a colder part of the country, planting bulbs directly into the ground in the fall is really all they need. But if you live in a warmer part, you'll probably want to pre-chill the bulbs first, and you can do this by simply putting them in your refrigerator. However, you never want to store bulbs near ripening fruit like apples. You see, apples give off ethylene gas, which can actually destroy the tiny flower bud inside these bulbs. Now, if you don't want to give up any refrigerator space, you can always buy bulbs that have been pre-chilled. When you get around to planting, go for bulbs that are fresh and healthy looking and very firm, and avoid those that have been frozen or look dried and withered. They're not worth the effort. Now here's a design tip you may want to consider when planting bulbs. Be generous, plant with abundance. I like to plant in drifts of at least 10 to 14 bulbs of one variety. You get the most visual impact this way. And also remember, plant bulbs that'll come back year after year in an area of your garden where you're not going to constantly be digging and disturbing them. Now one other thing you may want to consider when choosing bulbs for your garden, many bulbs such as daffodils, tulips and peonies will bloom at different times of the year. They're early, mid and late season bloomers. So by choosing some bulbs from each of these categories, you can really extend the bloom season in your garden. More flowers over a longer period of time. What could be better? I wanted to bring you into my workshop and show you a couple of winter wreath projects I've been working on. It's a great way to bring the outdoors in, and it captures this idea of shape and form. Let's take a look at some of the finished pieces. Now, these two wreaths are made of different types of boxwood. This one is made of English box, Buxa sempervirens, and you can see that the leaf shape is shaped like a small spear point. Now, over here, this one is Buxus microphylla. It's an oriental type boxwood, and the leaf shape is slightly rounder. 
As you can see, both make beautiful wreaths. Now take a look at this shape, which is a more traditional shape for a wreath. I made this one with magnolia leaves. It makes a beautiful winter decoration. And for the holidays, you can dress it up just by adding some fruit, whether it's apples or pears or whatever. Let me show you how I put them together. Now let's start with the boxwood wreath. As you saw with the finished product, it's a square design. So I just simply used a frame that I picked up at a hobby store. You see, this is just a stretcher for a canvas for a painting, but they're perfect for making these square wreaths. Now, I've taken the frame and I've applied this oasis or floral foam onto it, and I've just used some floral wire to do that. These pieces are about two inches wide, and they're about three quarters of an inch thick, as you can see here. Now let's go back to this idea of attaching the floral foam to the wooden frame. I took a spool of florist wire like this and started at one end of the oasis and just began to wrap it around the frame and the oasis all the way around. Just make sure the oasis fits snug like this. Now all you have to do is add the boxwood and that's really quite simple. I like to use small pieces of boxwood like this to start. Then you just begin to apply the boxwood by pushing the stems into the oasis or floral foam like this. Now, what I like to do is use pieces that are about, oh, three to five inches long. You need to cut a lot of boxwood because it takes much more than you might think. And I make sure that the outer side of the leaf, not the underside, is facing you. And I work in the same direction. Now, once you get the boxwood all the way around on all four sides of the square. You'll have a finished product like that over there on the door. Now one thing to remember, use small pieces and lots of them. Pack them in a very dense way. And then once you're finished, you can take a pair of scissors and just trim up the edges like so. It's a bit like creating topiary, which is what we're doing. Topiary are clipped plants like these. Sometimes they're very geometric, and other times they can be quite whimsical. Topiary certainly embraced the idea of shape and form. I was in Germany not too long ago and ran into a couple of creative gardeners who've turned their backyard into a topiary wonderland. Check out their elephants, complete with tusks. One way to create elaborate topiary like this is to simply take chicken wire and form it into the shape you wish to create. Then grow boxwood or some other type of shrub or even ivy through the form and clip it. It's amazing what you can do with a little imagination. Speaking of imagination, let's get to work on that magnolia wreath. It's very simple to create. You want to start with a wire form like this, and you can pick these up at your local hobby shop. This is a 12-inch ring that I'm using, and I've gathered some magnolia out of the garden. Now, this is Magnolia grandiflora. It's a Native American magnolia that is really beautiful, perfect for the holidays. It's a plant that has beautiful, large, glossy leaves that are dark green on one side, and velvety brown on the back side. Now I like to start with the tips of the limbs like this because the leaves are already beautifully arranged and they're smaller and easier to work with. So that's what I gather in the garden and I bring them into the workshop. And then I just take these tips and pull them together like so where all of the leaves are facing the same direction. You can see like this. Then you just want to take a piece of floral wire and wrap it around the base like this. Make sure you get it good and tight. And then just tie it onto the frame at a slight angle. Like so. Now we're off and running with it. And what I like to do is make up several of these clusters like so and then you can just begin to layer them. You want to be generous with them and really pack them on. So I'm tying on another cluster like so. And see how they're sort of fish scaled, one set on top of the other, all moving in the same direction. I like to make up several of these at one time so I can just kind of get in a rhythm and lay them all across like so. Now for a wreath this size, it will take probably about 30 of these little bundles of leaves to go all the way around and create a circle takes a lot more than you might think, so gather plenty. All right, so we just carry that same theme all the way around, and what you end up with is the finished product as you see over here on the wall. There's really nothing to making these. All you need is the wire form, some wire, 
and wire cutters, and of course the magnolia. These are beautiful, adorned with Granny Smith apples and a ribbon for the holidays. Just look at the contrast of those two colors of green. It's just beautiful. Now, if you decide you want to attach fruit to the wreath, you want to make sure that you use pipe cleaners rather than using the, uh, the wire because you see the wire will actually tear through the flesh of the apple. What I just did is I took a floral pick and stuck it into the core of the apple. And now I'm sliding a pipe cleaner through it like so. And then I'll just pull that around like this. And then you can attach the fruit to the wire cage like so. Now once you have all the leaves wrapped around the wreath ring like this, you'll end up with results like that over there on the wall. Of course, the main thing to remember is just have some fun and let your imagination be your guide when it comes to bringing the beauty of nature from outside indoors. As a garden designer, I'm always looking for new and interesting ways to use plants. And now that I know a little bit more about how the calla lily responds to the garden from one year to the next, I'm more likely to use them in some of my planting schemes. I also got really excited about ornamental grasses when I was in Holland. I had an opportunity to meet an innovative landscape designer who's internationally recognized. Pete Oldolf was kind enough to show me around his garden and tell me a little bit about the inspiring plants he uses. Oh my goodness, this is gorgeous, Pete. Where do you get inspiration for your work? Now, nowadays I would say from nature, but uh, in fact it's something that they developed through the years. Well, your style is very naturalistic. Yeah, it is, but it's not, uh, of course the plants are not wild. They're cultivated plants that behave very well for the garden, but they try to catch the emotion you get in the wild or in nature. Yes, I can see that. But they're not all wild, but they look uh, very much as they are wild plants. You use a lot of grasses as well. Yeah, but not more than 30%, I think, otherwise they take over. So I see, yeah. You need uh, um, the character of the, of the uh, perennials come out very well against the grasses, but we use the grasses for the lushness, the, the, the movement. Yes, the movement is so good, isn't it? They're a beautiful backdrop for the perennials. They are, yes, and uh, you see they work like curtains from one uh, side. Uh, to the other side, it's, it, yeah, it's a beautiful backdrop. And they move in the wind and the colors are good in autumn. And they sometimes are a support for the perennials or the other way around. Pete, along with the grasses, I see lots of friends from home. There's so many North American native plants here in this garden. Yeah, but they're beautiful plants and uh, many of them flower in summer and late summer, so uh, why not? You know, in, in combination with all the plants you already have, but I think many of them are in gardens for ages. Well, here we are in late summer, and the garden is really uh, uh, rising to a crescendo with all the blooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, some of the some of the North American native plants that you've used a lot in this mm -hmm. garden include yeah. the Joe Pye weed, of course, and then the purple coneflower. Yes, the helenium, but also Amsonias, uh, Panicums. If we talk about grasses, Monardas. And and summer flocks that we we've summer seen in flocks, gardens yeah. for for years. It's an old-fashioned yeah. favorite. No, it is a favorite. It's so much energy going on that I think that is what gets you. So it doesn't matter. Um, don't think that your whole garden has to flower. Find the right balance. Yeah, having things that will produce foliage and texture, yeah. that's equally important to the bloom. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. So, Pete, what are some of your favorite combinations that you've discovered of late? Um, now, I think working with, um, not only working with grasses, but the combination with umbellifers and grasses to make, give it more the, the natural spirit. So I think you move forward in, in making it even more natural, okay. looking natural. But at the same time, it should be um, a garden. Pete has a lot of room to grow massive ornamental grasses and perennials in his garden. But sometimes in our home landscapes, we encounter plants that tend to fall over and require some support. Sometimes caging these plants is the best way to keep them beautiful and upright. To create a simple wire cage for support, I use concrete reinforcing wire and cut it leaving long tines at the base to push in the ground and enough on the sides to latch the ends together. 
This material is relatively inexpensive and you can find it at any builder supply. A few years ago I made up several of these so I could use them just as I needed them in my garden. They'll last forever. These cages are also effective in bringing large plants under control, like this big ornamental grass called variegated miscanthus. It's become a garden thug, smothering some of my roses and summer flocks. I'll just connect two of these and wrap it around the base. An even more natural and less expensive approach to keeping your flowers up where you can enjoy them is to use twigs. This is particularly effective for light and airy perennials like this baby's breath. There's nothing to using them. Just push the sticks into the ground and weave the plants up through them. Now doesn't it make sense after you've spent so much time growing such beautiful flowers to give them a little support? As we talk about this idea of shape and form in this show and how it manifests itself over and over again in the garden, I'm reminded of how plant breeders actually alter the shape and form of some of our most beloved and common annuals, like the impatience. We've probably all grown these shade-loving beauties, but maybe you haven't tried some of the new and improved varieties, like the New Guinea Supersonics. These guys will really knock your socks off if you like big blooms that can take dim lighting conditions. Impatience aren't the only old-fashioned flower that's getting a makeover from plant breeders. Geraniums are another example. Today they're bigger and bolder and come in so many different colors. Just take a look at these geraniums at a show place for new plant introductions. It's not just the traditional red anymore. The Flower Fields Tango series of geranium is getting a lot of attention these days. People are always asking me about the varieties of plants I grow in my garden and I'm always happy to share them. Throughout part of this show, I've been assembling this simple but beautiful arrangement of calla lilies. You know, there's nothing like having fresh flowers in your home. So next, I want to share with you some tips that'll help your fresh flowers last longer. So the next time you put together an arrangement or just want to splash a color indoors, hopefully these tips will come in handy. If you can work it into your schedule, it's always best to cut flowers in the early morning. You see the stems and leaves are full of water at this time of day, and you want to try to cut them before the sun has been on them too long. When choosing flowers, I always go for those with lots of buds, and I always try to get as long a stem as possible, and I make my cuts at a slight angle and get them into water as soon as possible. Helping flowers last longer is all about keeping as much moisture in them as you can. That's why it's not a good idea to gather them in a basket. I prefer using these tall galvanized cans because they can hold a lot of water and this helps to saturate the stems of the flowers. These cans also help hold them more upright. After you've cut the flowers, put them in a cool dark place out of the sun. Once you're ready to arrange them in a vase, make a solution of 50-50 lemon-lime soda and water and a dash of bleach. Also, before you slide your flowers into the solution, remove all the lower leaves. This will help keep the water fresh and clear. Now this may seem like a lot to remember, but it's amazing what it can do for your cut flowers. We've certainly covered a lot of ground in today's show. We met a garden designer who's becoming so well known for contrasting shapes and forms in dramatic and inspiring ways. We've taken a look at two wreath ideas that will help you bring the garden indoors during the coldest months of winter. And we looked at the unique shape and form of this plant, the calla lily, with a visit to a farm in Holland. Plus, if you decide to make a garden fresh arrangement, some of the tips I gave you will help the flowers last much longer. I hope some of these ideas help you as you continue to blur the lines between your home and garden. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. You know, architecture plays such an important role in the garden home. So in this show, We'll learn a little bit more about how to combine the style of your house with the garden. I'll show you some gardens I've created and take you to Holland for inspiration. Plus show you a container project that can take your home from season to season. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. 
Looking forward to seeing you in the garden home. Mm -hmm.